Hello. You have a vocab. <laughs> you have a vocab quiz tomorrow and Thursday. You have four for a total this week. You have a 35 question test on Friday, all on uh, unit four, five, and six. Yesterday we did four. Today we're doing five. At the top of your notes, you should write 1750, 1900. We're officially in a new time period. <laughs> Your test on Friday will be 35 minutes because we just got to get to time. Friendly reminder <laughs> that on a, uh, next Saturday, not this Saturday, but Saturday. we have our mock exam, Yay. which I've worked really hard on. So you need to be at school at 745, not 44. Sure as hell not 743. I'm saying 745. Um, the exam probably starts at, at 8. Like the directions are going to start spewing out, and you will begin at 8. So that's April 22nd. And after that, after I finish grading all those things, you will have a brand new Samantha Bennett who doesn't care about you once I finish, because I'll be so happy. And I'll have beach weekends in my future. <sighs> huh? That's after the exam. Yeah. Nothing. I'm literally selling my soul over the next six days to get it graded. So nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Enlightenment. You need to know that the Enlightenment is after the Renaissance by a pretty big gap. However, right before the Enlightenment, we have the Scientific Revolution. So it goes Renaissance, Scientific Revolution, then Enlightenment. The Scientific Revolution is when people start critically and analyzing the world around us and looking for actual proof. They take that critical eye looking for proof and challenges to ideas that have always stood and apply that now to government. The enlightenment is the challenging of governmental structures. What? How does this like, uh, affect Christianity? Like, do they start Deism. They start seeing Christianity and the scientific revolution, they start seeing it as not that God controls everything. God created a perfect world like a clock, and he just set it into motion. So God's not sitting like behind you being like, Cyrus is doing this, Cyrus is doing that, Cyrus is doing this. It's that he created this perfect world using the laws of science, and he has put it into motion. That's one of the big popular thoughts. Okay. So, scientific revolution gets people super critical about things and starts challenging, and that will lead us to the Enlightenment, which people start criticizing the government. What's the traditional government pre-Enlightenment, Tejas? Huh? Monarchy. There you go. And they're going to start saying, well, wait a second. Why do we have to have a monarchy? Can we do something different? Can we challenge this? Is this really the best way to do things? And that's where it all starts from. You should know that when we talk about the Enlightenment, you have to think of John Locke. John Locke is probably the most important of the Enlightenment thinkers and has had the most influence here in the United States. His two things is social contract, which he does with Hobbes. He kind of parrots a little bit off of Hobbes. And he does um, the natural rights, which is life, liberty, and property. Okay. Then you have Thomas Hobbes who is known for a social contract, that's his like, big claim to fame, that says that the government is allowed to rule because the people allow it to occur. So when the people don't want the government to occur, they have the right to <laughs> overthrow. So it's the justification of overthrowing a king or whatever else, and this is a huge idea. So Thomas Hobbes' social contract, that the people allow government to uh, rule. 
Your next one that you should know is Adam Smith, of course. Adam Smith is the father of capitalism. He writes the book, The Wealth of Nations, in 1776. An easy date to remember. No? All right. Father of capitalism. Uh, he's the guy behind capitalism and laissez-faire, and obviously he's going to replace what economic theory era? Mercantilism. Okay. So, Montesquieu, you should know, is also an Enlightenment thinker. Montesquieu believes in what will? AP Gov? Yeah. Then you have Voltaire, who is what? Nina, AP Gov? Yes, and what uh, amendment is his? Unit four. What? Unit four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've ruined you, Nina. I've ruined you. I'm so sorry. I've really destroyed you. I'm sorry. It is technically unit four, so <laughs> I have ruined you. It's um, the First Amendment is Voltaire. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Uh, freedom of assembly. That's all Voltaire. All right. Um, you need to know that women are going to play a huge role on uh, the Enlightenment, ladies and gentlemen. It is women who are facilitating it. We're the ones hosting dinner parties where we invite John Locke to speak to fabulous people who will inspire and send these ideas. It is women who are doing the work, which is why it is going to inspire what to occur. Feminism, yes, because we're tired of being left behind, damn it. <coughs> we do all the things, and then we get no respect at the end. Anyway, feminism, you should know that it is going to start in Europe first because the alignment starts in Europe, and it will eventually spread to the United States. A couple big names that you should know, of course, is Mary Wollstonecraft. You should know Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, especially for here in the United States. Okay, Seneca Falls Convention, Declaration of Sentiments. These are all happening in the late 1700s. So the idea that feminism is like a new thing is completely delusional. <laughs> it's not. Women have wanted equality since the Greek and Roman times. So let's not be fooling ourselves here. All right. Other major ideas that are going to come about because of the Enlightenment, the challenging the status quo, challenging the norms. That's why we have these big ideas coming out. Abolitionism, which is a, a eradication of slavery, of course. What country is the first one to ban slavery, Ryland? How did you do on your test today? Have you taken it yet? Oops. Are you pumped? Yes. Are you concerned? No. Oh, okay. I like the clip of confidence here. Look at you, Ryland. I had no doubt you could do it. Who is the first country to give up, uh, to ban slavery? First country was, is it Britain? It is Britain. Who's the last country I reminded you yesterday? Brazil. Brazil, what year? It's a pretty year. It's an easy one to remember. Three of the same digits. It was late. It was like... I mean, it's not late. It was like 1800s. Like Dude, I didn't get the right to vote until 1920. So be careful <laughs> what you're saying <laughs> late. Slavery. Yeah, I know. It's still late, but... When you say late in context of time, yeah, we're in 2023. Like, like Britain is doing it probably like 680 years before. Anyway, what year is it? Um, They're all the same dates here, dude. What year is it, Nina? Three of the digits are the same. Three digits are the same. Huh? Three. Yeah. 1911. Okay, yeah. No, 1888 people write it down. I said it. I said it's not in my. I said it's not in my. I said it's not in my. Yeah, I did hear that one. Well, it's with that haircut. I just can't hear you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I didn't hear it. All right, here we go. Uh, 1888. Revolutions! Are you ready for me to review the American one in about 10 seconds? Mike could, could be more, couldn't be more bored if you tried. He's got a smirk on his face now at least. Here we go, American Revolution. What year is it, Andreas? Damn it, Andreas. Damn it, Andreas. <laughs> 
You're in AP Cub. You live in America. You knew this date since you were a little kid. <clears throat> Jesus. He's in my AP Gov class. Do you know what I talk about all the damn time in AP Gov? Is this stupid revolution. Do you know how many times I've mentioned in AP Gov the stupid date? Do you know how many times, Giselle? Do you think it was once? Do you think it was twice? you think it was maybe 50 times? Maybe last week on its own, I mentioned it 20 times. Are we picking a date? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're an AP Gov. What year did the war end? That's like 86. Something What? No, the by the way, by the way, just fun fact, just so you can conceptualize why I'm broken. One, two, three, four. AP Gov. AP Gov. I see you, Lucy. Lucy is also not chimed in a word at all, and she's also AP Gov. We got, we got the date. Evan mostly screamed it from the back, so... You do take AP Gov. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 1776 is when the war begins. No. <laughs> 1781 is when the war ends. By the time everything gets said and done, um, we have the Articles of Confederation, which are signed into power in 1783. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 1787 is what year? The Constitution. Okay. My AP Gov kids have retained one date. Well, yeah, with the Declaration of Independence, which is signed in 1776, which we immediately go to war on. No. No. There's a whole other failed government in there, friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I didn't teach you articles. I didn't teach you articles of confederation because you don't need to know. Did we skip that week? No, I don't need to teach it to you. In AP Gov, I do. 1776, the American Revolution began. 1781, the revolution ends. Okay, you need to know. The major document is the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is the last Enlightenment thinker. It is going to give us independence from England. The next revolution is the French Revolution. The French Revolution is in three parts. The first one, oh, what is the major quote of the American Revolution? What's the major quote, Lucy? Yes, at least I got one good AP Gov kid in the room. <laughs> no taxation without representation is your big quote, right, Rickert? What is the big quote for AP? Nope, for uh, French Revolution. Yes, but I also taught it. I don't need you to say it. I translate it into English for you, and you do need to know it. Life, liber uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. You need to know that for the French one. The French has three stages to it. The first one is what we call the French Revolution, where people are in the streets. You should know the Bastille, which is a medieval tower in the middle of <coughs> Paris um, that they storm, and that's the official start of the French Revolution. The second stage is when the Jacobians take power, and you have a guy named Maximilien Robespierre who's going through what we call the Reign of Terror. Huh? Uh, the first stage is like the actual like French Revolution, like people in the streets shooting at each other, like give me liberty, all that crap. Second stage is what we call the Reign of Terror, led by Jacobians, specifically by Maximilian Robespierre. They're killing everyone. They're the ones using the guillotine and chopping off heads into baskets. 
They're the ones killing all the aristocracy and killing the king and doing all the things. You should know it's Louis the... 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. He's Louis the 16th. <laughs> Louis the 14th is known as the Sun King. He's the guy who does Versailles. He's that guy. Louis the 16th is the guy who gets his head in a basket. Was that too visual for you at 9.45? Apparently, you can move, blink your eyes for like oh, 30 seconds that. after. Mm -hmm. What? Which part was when they reinstated the king? Yeah, that's we, ha I haven't gotten there yet. We have an emperor here in a second. Well, not an emperor. They reinstated the king somewhere in the middle. Did they not? No, not well, for that's us. That's why I thought that's they, the king was executed when they reinstated one for like four years. That's minutes. England. England goes. I'm almost positive. That's fine. You don't need to know it for France. There's a lot of things we go through that we kind of skim through because it's not a huge transitional. But I don't think that's happening in the French Revolution. They may implement a king later and then remove him. The French are very tumultuous. Here we go. They're in the middle of a full protest right now anyway. Here we go. You need to know the first stage is actual the French Revolution. The second stage is the Reign of Terror led by Maximilien Robespierre and his Jacobians. They are unpopular because they're too extreme. Because they're so unpopular, because they're too extreme, you know, killing everybody. A guy named Napoleon comes into power. Napoleon is going to rise into power and eventually become named Emperor of France. As soon as he becomes Emperor of France, he starts conquering two-thirds of Europe. He is going to conquer and successfully lead to the rise of the French Empire. He is going to lose what major battle? First, Micah. His invasion of what? Hitler's going to try to do it and he's going to lose it too. Russia. Russia. Sorry, Jen Ren just texted me. I'm in trouble. Um, <clears throat> no, I need to send her an email. Shit, I forgot. Russia. He invades Russia and he fails because supply lines were too long and they showed up in their summer uniforms. Oopsies. So he's going to lose. He's going to go back to France and he gets back to France and he's like, hey guys, I'm sorry about your sons. My bad. And the people of France are like, death to you. So they send him to Corsica. You don't need to write this part down. He gets to Corsica, and there's a cute milkmaid. I don't know if she's cute, but in my head she's cute. And they fall in love, and she's like, all right, I'll row you back to shore. And she rows him back to shore. And then he gets off, and he's like, bye. Thanks for the memories, and rides off. And he goes back to France. And France has been pretty shit without Napoleon because he's been hanging out in Corsica for two years. So he gets back to France, and he's like, I'm back, baby! And people out of France are like, yeah! And they make him emperor a second time! A second time! Have you been named emperor once? This guy got it twice! Anyway, he's only in power for 100 days. Write it down, you do need to know the 100 days part. <laughs> only in power for 100 days. Things are not going well for the second time. No, we've transitioned to Napoleon. Yeah, third stage of Napoleon, people. So, he's in power for 100 days, and he is going to lose at what battle? He starts with a W, Waterloo. He loses at the Battle of Waterloo to a British general. The British general's last name is a meat dish. You put a steak tenderloin, cover it with mushrooms, and then you put a puff pastry around it. Beef Wellington. His last name is Beef Wellington. No, his last name is Wellington. <laughs> his last name is Wellington, and that's how I remember who he beat, uh, who beat Napoleon. What? That's weird. That's weird. Why is it at your grandma's house? Oh, okay. Um, once he loses, he is put back on an island and they don't put any cute milk maids. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I mean, he's not living in like a shack. And he um, drinks himself to death and falls down a flight of stairs. 
Well, he was drinking and then fell down a flight of stairs, broke his neck. Oh, okay. Napoleon. Haitian. So it goes American, French, Haitian. Haitian Revolution is led by Toussaint Lay Overture. You need to know, it is the first successful slave rebellion in history. It is also the first successful rebellion led by all blacks, Haley. It's a huge deal. Toussaint Lay Overture is a true believer in the Enlightenment philosophies. Now, he is going to overthrow the French. What is the French mil what is the French? Great. What are the French doing during the revolution? What is the majority of the military doing, sailor? Yeah, they're doing the Napoleonic War. So for the 30 years they've been fighting, so they're not really paying attention to an island in the Caribbean, and that's why Toussaint Louverture has his success. He is going to be successful. As we know, the French are going to lose the island of Haiti, and they're going to punish it by how? How have the French punished Haiti even still to this day? How have they done it, Micah? There you go. They said anyone that trades with Haiti can no longer trade with France, and it's completely destroyed their entire economy even still to this day. There's uh, Haiti today, right now, currently in 2023, is a nation on the brink of complete collapse. Um, there are five rival gangs trying to take over control over Haiti right now, and it is a humanitarian disaster. People are getting shot all the time. Hospitals are failing. Government has failed. Yeah, he got assassinated about a year and a half ago. It's like complete insanity. Creole revolutions are happening in Latin America. This is when they are removing the Spanish. A couple things you should know about the Creole revolutions. They are successful in eradicating the Spanish. There will be no more Spanish-held colonies in Latin America. However, they failed to set up stable governments. And that's the unfortunate thing. So the good thing is they do actually kick the Spanish out, but unfortunately, they don't create stable governments. A specific example of this would be Mexico has nine revolutions. Yeah, very tumultuous. However, there are some high points. And the high point is Simon Bolivar. He is the real hero of the Creole Revolution. He leads nine revolutions, for God's sake. I mean, George Washington looks lazy. Can we agree? Next to Simon. Jeez. With that being said, he is responsible for writing the Jamaica Letter, which is going to rally support around his cause. That's his big claim to fame, which we read it in uh, one of your primary sources, by the way. He is going to write the Jamaica letter. He is also a Creole, by the way. So he's a mixed blood, which is interesting. Um, and he is going to want to create the Grand Columbia. The Grand Columbia is modeled after the United States. It's a federation of states. So instead of all of these countries trying to set up their own governments, their own currency, their own government structure, they could do it together and really strengthen it does not happen and he gets so sad he gets he walks into the jungle and then he dies in the jungle of tuberculosis ah that was what it was what um, there's multiple yeah it's a mixed blood anytime you see mix it's white with something else because then it's like in like social structures though it's like they're completely white they were yes there, there's multiple the only ones you definitively have to know in peninsulars which are white people literally imported from europe and then uh, mestizos, which are white with mix. Okay. There you go. No. Okay. Unification. You and I both know I talked about this in like 12 different weeks. Can we talk about that? Italy and German unification? It. Bitter. <laughs> yes. Italy's unification, you need to know it's led by Count Camillo Cavour, and it's unifying Italy into one nation. The funny thing about 2023 is, is what? They're trying to break apart. North wants to get away from the South. The South wants to cling to the North. Because <laughs> where is all the money in 2023, the North or the South? It's all in the North. Milan is the wealthiest city in uh, Italy. All right. Next one is German unification. And you and I both know you only need to know two Germans. And if it's not Hitler, it has to be? Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck. You and I both know this name comes up 400 times. Okay. Count, uh, nope. 
Otto von Bismarck is the guy who's known for iron and blood. That's his little quote, which is pretty cool. Okay, he unifies Germany by force, but iron refers to industrialization. Okay, he is going to be leading Italy, uh, Germany up until World War I, which is why we talk about him 4,000 times. I know. He's, he's just one of those things that just, like, continues on for, like, an obscenely long time, and you just, like, don't understand why. There's only a few of those, but Otto von Bismarck is one of them. No, I, I've never <laughs> thought anyone was a vampire. I mean, I make jokes about the queen who's dead now. I made lots of jokes about her. I mean, that chick was like 400. Here we go. Nationalism is rising in all these countries because of the idea of being special because of the country and the culture you are from. That is what is going to inspire unification. We're also dealing that inside the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire is starting to fragment, which will eventually lead to its demise. In what year, Zoe? What year does the Ottoman Empire actually collapse? You should know the year. She's so confused. If you saw her face right now, she's like, this is like the wildest thing anyone's ever asked me. 19 what? 40? No, Evan's wrong. Tages. No, you're wrong. 18, 18, 18, 18. I'm so sorry. I don't know why. 1918 is typically when we credit the Ottoman Empire's collapse because it's the end of what war? World War I. They don't make it to the end of World War I and it disappears. All right. Industrial Revolution. All of your revolutions happen at five. Isn't that nice? Now, I will say, I think we did a good job in this unit and you should feel pretty confident in this stuff, don't you think? Okay. The Industrial Revolution. You should know that we are going from cottage industries which is when women are just making extra cash on the side by making extra cakes making extra thread making extra clothes and selling it on the side so the evolution from cottage industries to the uh, the industrial revolution is a huge jump now you should know when we talk about cottage industries it is mostly women who are doing it now, as soon as we start getting agricultural improvements, like the seed drill, population goes up, and that's what inspires the Industrial Revolution. Anytime the population rises, we typically have proto-industrialization, which is going to spur into our next component. When we talk about um, the Industrial Revolution, it's all about what product. What is the most important product during the Industrial Age? It's the most valuable one, Nina. No. But I, I appreciate, this is not a terrible answer. Wade? Textiles. Textiles are the most popular item. Because keep in mind, before the industrial age, you had to make your own thread to make your own fabric, which is what textiles are. So the most important item coming from the age of, ex no, oh my god, age of exploration, that's wild. From the Industrial Revolution is going to be all of your textile spinning jenny, the water frame, all those types of things. Interchangeable parts, the fact that um, a screw can fit multiple items, not just one singular, specialization of labor, and of course the assembly line. Now, when we talk about it, we know what country is starting at Vela. Britain, because Britain has what two major resources? Christian? No. Brass? No. What are the two things, Kira? Iron ore, not iron. Iron's a finished product. Iron ore is uh, from the ground. England has plenty. Remember that annoying map? map? You had to draw yes. all of it? We're still working through that over there. Okay. So, they also have lots of waterways. If you've ever been to England and ever went to the north of England, it's all waterways. Carytown, have anyone been to Carytown? It's actually like one of my favorite places in the whole world. Anyway, all right, industrialization starts in England, but it's going to spread to the United States really quick, France, Germany. Those are the first four major industrialized powers. England, US, France, Germany um, are going to industrialize right away. 
Japan is going to industrialize after who shows up? Commodore Matthew Perry goes knocking on the door and forces the doors open. They're going to industrialize. Now, it is important for you to know that France, Germany, and U.S. are doing private industrialization, which means companies are spurring this along. England, France, U.S., and Germany. Those four countries are doing privatized industrialization, which means private companies are industrializing. In both Russia and Japan, it is by co it's governmental industrialization, which means the government is trying to spearhead it. Of the two governmental industrialization, which one is the successful one? Which one is a disaster? Russia. Keep in mind, Russia doesn't actually industrialize until Stalin and his five-year plan. And that's not until the 1930s. This is in the 1810s at this point. So they're a long ways away, but they do try to industrialize. So when we talk about Russia, we could talk about um, what plan. Does anyone remember the plan in Russia? They're going to build what railway in Russia? Trans-Siberian Railway is a positive thing. All right, anyway. Okay, let's talk Industrial Revolution. So we have the Industrial Revolution, we're gonna start using coal, and then we have the second Industrial Revolution, there's technically two, and this one's all about steel production and oil. This is when we start really transferring into the modern day society that we are expecting. So in the second Industrial Revolution in the 19th and 20th centuries, that's when we start seeing the steel production because of the Bessemer, okay? Which is gonna be created by Andrew Carnegie. Oh my God, Carnegie, like the hall, yeah, that dude. He's going to perfect steel production, which is why what city did he build it in? Pittsburgh. That's why they're called the Steelers. We talked about this. Okay, oil, electricity, and all those big inventions are coming from it. Hmm? It's Irish. It's Irish Scott. I don't remember what it is. No, all you need is the last name. Carnegie. All right. Um... Carnegie, like Carnegie Hall, like one of the wealthiest families in the United States, too. So. All right, you do need to know railroads are going to be absolute necessities because railroads are needed to transport finished goods, manufactured goods or finished goods, and the raw materials in order to get them to their places. There are two railroads you need to know. The first one is, of course, the Trans-Siberian one, which is built by the WIT system. Yes! Yes, I got it. I didn't come up with it before, but I got it. W-I-T-T-E. Come at me, bruh. Got it. Yes. Thanks. It was really annoying me. What is that system? It's the Trans-Siberian Railway. That was the first attempt at Russia at industrializing, and it was a complete failure except for the... There you go. Uh, and then the United States has the Transcontinental Railway which is connecting our east coast to our west coast and that will facilitate Americans moving across the continent. Okay. The Ottomans are going to reject industrialization because they're just like, meh, it's a fad. They kind of move on. The Japanese are going to embrace industrialization when Matthew Perry comes and opens their doors in 1853. The Japanese closed the doors in order to protect themselves from the Europeans, and now they're being forced open by Americans, and they're really confused. Once the Japanese doors are open, they are going to get rid of what government structure? Sailor? Tokugawa shogunate are going to fall, and they'll be replaced by who? Nina? Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration are pro-industrialization, and they are going to lead a government-led industrial revolution that is incredibly successful. Goodbye. Bye, Cyrus. Have a nice day, Cyrus. And I do like the haircut, man. I think you should do whatever makes you happy. And if you like it, do it.